I've got another interesting message. This one is really, really unique. And you're going to have to think a little bit, but it's very powerful and it's going to help you defend the Christian worldview again in a very, very unique way. I went over my background this morning, so I'm not going to repeat everything, but I thought what I should probably do is give you my real background, <laughs> not what I presented this morning. Um, but here's, here's my real background. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. That, that's how I see myself. I'm, I'm nobody special, but God uses just about anyone, and I'm proof of that. So I'm thankful that God lets me go along for the ride with this ministry. But another verse I relate to very much is uh, John 4.44, where Jesus said, A prophet has no honor in his hometown. That's why I travel all the time. <laughs> because I get no respect. <laughs> if you don't know who that is, ask your parents. If you're really young and you don't know, ask your grandparents. <laughs> uh, but just a little bit of repeat for those who weren't here this morning. I founded a ministry about 17 years ago called The Starting Point Project. And this evening's talk is all about starting points. So I won't go any further than that because the talk will be self-explanatory. I did mention that I was also along the way invited to be on the board of directors of Logos Research Associates, uh, the world's largest group of scientists who are Christians and creationists. I mentioned the guy who founded it, Dr. John Sanford. He was a professor at Cornell University. He's famous for having invented the gene gun, which inserts genes into the DNA. And then there's Dr. John Baumgartner, who invented the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. Even the secular geologists use that to see how plates of the Earth are moving. So myself and a bunch of other board members. And I really do get to glean a lot from them and then put it into talks. These guys are brilliant. They don't necessarily have speaking skills. Some of them do, some of them don't. But again, I get, kind of get to serve as the middleman to interpret this for the rest of the world. But um, very thankful to be part of that group. I became president a year ago of the group. Um, and I mentioned we do Grand Canyon tours. And some of you are going on the Grand Canyon tour. The rest of you need to go on the Grand Canyon tour. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to get on the bus that filled up, we do have other trips available. I would highly recommend you do that. If you don't end up going on a Grand Canyon tour with myself, that's okay, but go with some creation group with the scientists who can take you there, explain the Genesis flood, and show you firsthand some of the best evidence you'll ever see. It is so unbelievably powerful. It'll really fire you up in your faith. And again, we got brochures back at the table if you want to learn more information or from a website. So the talk I'm giving tonight, the official title is actually Faith is Not a Four-Letter Word. But there's a problem with that. <laughs> I, I put a video together on that. I wrote a book on that. And then I found out from some youth, they don't know what a four-letter word is. They're not familiar with the phrase four-letter words. So they'd come up to me and they'd say, no, faith isn't four letters, it's five. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. The point is four-letter words are bad. They're the swear words. Faith isn't bad, and faith isn't a four-letter word. It's five letters, but if I have to explain it, I guess it's not that clever. <laughs> so just to simplify this, I'm just calling it the myth of facts versus faith. And that's what we're going to be focused on here, the idea that skeptics are all about facts and Christians just have faith. I'll explain that more as we get through this. So we're living in a world today that pits facts versus faith. The skeptics tell us they are all about facts, and they're actually proven things. Whereas Christians, you know, we just have you know, faith, and you just have to believe it. And, and even many Christians feel that way, and it makes them hesitant to share their faith. Because do you really want to debate some astrophysicist or something like that when you're telling them, well, they just need to trust Jesus, and they're throwing all these facts and science at you, and that's from the real world, and you want them to kind of forget about that and live in some antiquated world where we study some old, outdated, antiquated, disproved religious book? That Again, that's sometimes the mindset of Christians in general. So we're going to be taking a look at this. First, we'll see what others think about this idea of faith. They say, faith is not a virtue. Faith is gullibility, dishonesty, blindness, absence of reason. Faith should not be respected. It should be detested. And a quote from Sam Harris, he's one of the leading atheists around today. He said, it's time we admitted that faith is nothing more than the license religious people to give to one another to keep believing when reason fails. Christopher Hitchens, he was a leading atheist, died a few years ago. He said, it's called faith because it's not knowledge. 
And then Richard Dawkins, arguably the world's leading atheist today. I actually really like Richard Dawkins because I think he's pretty straightforward. He's just saying it like it is from an atheistic standpoint. And I think that's very helpful to understand what do atheists believe. He probably wouldn't like me, and that, that's fine. I'm okay with that. But I really do appreciate hearing from him and learning from him. This is what he said. Faith is a great cop-out. The great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in, in spite of, even because of the lack of evidence. So these guys are not impressed with the idea of faith. Even Mark Twain said this, Faith is believing what you know ain't so. <laughs> we know it's not true, but we're going we're gonna to believe it anyway. That's what faith is all about. And again, even many Christians kind of have that feeling about faith. And it's even crept into many churches. And I'm not even talking about extreme liberal churches. I'm talking about some even fairly conservative churches. Here's a sign outside of one church said this, reason is the greatest enemy that faith has. I think that's a terrible message to be portraying to people driving by the church. What does scripture say? Isaiah says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Romans 12, 2 does not say, be ye transformed by the removal of your mind. <laughs> Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. God wants us to use the brains that he's given us. Here's another sign. It said, if your faith is big enough, facts don't count. Don't worry about all that pesky science and those facts things. If your faith is strong enough, that doesn't even matter. Again, terrible message to be portraying to people driving by the church. Now, we're going to be talking about defending the Christian faith, the Christian worldview, and you can break Christianity down into two major elements. You want to make it as simple as possible, two major things. Number one, God exists, and number two, you're not him. <laughs> That's not really the second one. The second one is the Bible is the Word of God. God exists, and the Bible is the Word of God. If we could prove these two things, we'd be done. We wouldn't have to prove the creation account is true because the Bible says God created things. And if we've already proven that God exists and the Bible is his word, then the creation account is true. We wouldn't have to prove the flood because the Bible says there was a flood. We wouldn't have to prove the deity of Jesus because the Bible says that. But there's a problem with this approach. And here's the problem. God doesn't need you to prove that he exists. And you can't technically prove... <laughs> That the Bible's the inspired word of God. Now, it might make you a little nervous, like, whoa, this is going pretty good, and all of a sudden the wheels fell off here. Hang in there. This is going to make perfect sense as we unpack this, and it's actually going to be the very thing that helps you defend the Christian worldview. Very, very powerful. So you just, you just got to be patient here. Now, when you think about the existence of God, the first thing that probably pops into your head is a coil of rope, right? <laughs> Maybe that's just me. <laughs> Here's the point. Let's say you went to a hardware store and you asked the guy for one meter of rope. So he goes over the coil, cuts off a piece off, and gives it to you. He says, here you go. And you ask him, how do I know this is a meter? He says, well, I know it's a meter because they use a tape measure. He's appealing to a higher authority. It's not just his opinion. He used a tape measure. It makes sense. Then you ask him, how do I know the tape measure is accurate? He said, well, I know the tape measure is accurate because they make it in the manufacturing plant where they do it just right. He's appealing to an even higher authority. Not his opinion, not the tape measure, the manufacturing plant where they make these tape measures. And you're in a bad mood that day. You feel like giving them a hard time. How do I know they're doing it right in the manufacturing plant? He says, I know they're doing it right there because they're using the standards that were established at the General Council of Weights, Council of Weights and Measures in 1983, and they determined a meter is going to be the distance light travels in a vacuum in one three hundred millionth of a second. <laughs> a meter is that length because they said so. It's the end of the line. It's the ultimate authority for determining how long a meter is. They determine it. That is the standard. Now, you get this progression. We kept going up the ladder to a higher authority until you get to the end of the line. You're going to reach the end of the line. It doesn't go on forever. That is the ultimate authority for determining the length of a meter. Makes sense. With that in mind, think about this. If the Bible is truly the inspired word of God, then it's the ultimate authority. But if it's the ultimate authority, you can't go above it another step 
to prove that that's true. It's not like there's a mega God out there over our God. And we appeal to the mega God, and the mega God says, yeah, the book you're looking at, that was written by the subservient God that you guys worship. It doesn't work that way. When you're talking about God, you're at the end of the line. It's the ultimate authority. And if the Bible is the ultimate authority, end of the line, you don't prove that the Bible is from God. That belief is your starting point. You start with that belief. Now, at this point, you kind of get the logic and the progression, but you're like, what in the world would I do with that? Again, hang in there. It's going to make more and more sense as we develop this. Back to the whole facts versus faith. Skeptics are about facts, proven things. We just have this faith, which is wishful thinking, and puppy dogs, and fairy tales, and butterflies, and all that. <laughs> That's the mindset. Well, everyone, no matter who they are, every single person has to start somewhere with their belief system. It's impossible to not start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. We call this our starting point, our bias, our presuppositions, our beginning assumptions, or even our worldview. Everyone starts somewhere. The atheist wants you to think that their starting point is facts. They base everything on facts. You know, we're all about faith, but they base everything on facts. Well, you can ask this atheist a question. What do you mean by facts? And they might say, well, you know, science, we're in a laboratory doing things. <clears throat> and quick side note, I don't always have time to squeeze this in, but it's really important and I need to squeeze it in because I always get questions on this afterwards. <laughs> when we're talking about science, there are two types of science. There's an observational science and a historical science. Observational science deals with things that we can do in a laboratory. We can repeat. Everyone can see it. It's great stuff. It makes cell phones, cures diseases. Nobody's really debating that. Christians and atheists and Muslims and Buddhists and Mormons, we're doing the same science. We know how it works. That's not where the question is. That's not where the controversy is. The other type of science is called historical science, and that deals with events that happened in the past and no one saw it happen. The origin of the universe, the origin of life, and other things like that. That involves a lot of guesses and assumptions because we weren't there to see it. So when I'm referring to science, I'm not talking about making cell phones. We, we don't need to debate that. We know how that works. We can do it over and over and over. We're talking about other things like where did the universe come from? How did life get started? And things like that. So this atheist says they base everything on facts. Now they're telling us that facts is the science, the science of like guessing as to what happened a long time ago in the past. So then I would ask them, um, how do you know you can trust the science? Because the science is really thoughts and opinions of other men and women, most of which this atheist never even met them. So how do you know you can trust the thoughts and opinions and guesses and assumptions of these scientists? And he would say, well, I, I can think through what they're telling me, and I can tell that they're correct. Okay, so now you're using your reasoning to figure out why you think you can trust the thoughts and opinions of men and women that you've never met. I got another question then. How do you know you can trust your reasoning? Well, I mean, I know I can trust it because it's worked consistently throughout my life. Okay, so now you're using your reasoning to tell me why you can trust your reasoning, which is circular reason. <laughs> and then I would tell him, you know what? That's okay, though. And here's why. Everyone has to start somewhere. You can pick whatever you want because you've got to start somewhere. I just want you to better understand you're not really about facts. You assume you can trust your reasoning. But you can't actually prove that because you'd have to use your reasoning to do that, which is circular. So it's not something you can prove. It's just what you've chosen to assume to begin with, which is fine. Everyone gets, gets to pick something. But don't tell me you're just about facts. All right? What is the foundation, the starting point for Christians? Well, I've already mentioned that. Christians believe that God exists and the Bible is the Word of God. And then we use that foundation to define everything else, what science and logic actually are. Philosophy, history, ethics, morality, all those things are defined by what we've chosen for our starting point. Everyone picks something, <laughs> and then you go from there. So again, you kind of get that, but you're wondering well, what to do with that. Well, a typical defense of Christianity involves talking about the intricacies and complexities of DNA, Evidence for the resurrection, Greek and Hebrew Bible manuscripts. I've lectured on these things for 39 years. I did about 20 years of lecturing before I went into full-time ministry. So I've lectured on all these things for years. And I'll continue to do so, 
But here's the problem. You can't use evidence as proof. Why is that? It's not a problem for Christianity specifically. It's something in general. Nobody uses evidence as actual technical proof. So Christians can't use it as proof. Atheists can't use it as proof. And let me give you a few reasons why. It'll make sense in just a second as why you actually technically can't use evidence as absolute proof. Three reasons. In my full talk, I think I have seven examples, but here are three examples for this evening. The skeptic may have a different interpretation of the evidence. I mentioned this morning, facts don't speak for themselves. They all have to be interpreted. And the skeptic or the atheist might have a different interpretation of the evidence that you're discussing. Because again, facts don't speak for themselves. The facts are just there. They have to be interpreted to give them meaning. And let me give you an example. DNA. A Christian would talk about DNA and say, see, that's proof that God designed it because it's so complex, there's no way that that's an accident. That's proof that my view is true. That's what the Christian would say, looking at the evidence that we call DNA. But then you have an atheist looking at the exact same DNA. They're looking at the same evidence that you brought up. And they say, you know what? We don't think it was designed by God. We think that that's just what happens in nature. Over time, you know, atoms and particles, you give it enough time and, you know, just about anything's possible. We don't have all the answers yet, but, man, we're making so much progress. And eventually we'll have all those answers. So that DNA you brought up, we don't think it's proof of Christianity or God or design. We think that that's what nature can do if you give it enough time. Here's where it gets even more interesting. A third person looking at the same DNA. Let's say this third person is also an atheist. And they say, you know what? You Christians are right. There's no possible way that that DNA is an accident. It was designed. You're right. But it wasn't by your God of the Bible. It's by aliens. Now, that does sound a little funny, but you may have heard of Dr. Francis Crick. He was a co-founder, co-discoverer of the DNA molecule. Brilliant, brilliant scientist. But he was an atheist. So when he saw how complex DNA was, and his brilliant mind said, that can't happen by accident, he had to conclude it was designed. But he didn't want it to be the God of the Bible, but he needed a designer. So he decided, maybe four billion years ago, somewhere else in the universe, which we're not talking about science anymore, if it's four billion years ago and it's somewhere else in the universe you can't even see, four billion years ago, somewhere else in the universe, an alien race existed and they designed life in seed form, DNA and all that, put it on spaceships and flew it to Earth, dropped it off from there and it grew from there. That was his view. Now, it sounds silly. Did he come to that conclusion because he wasn't too sharp? Oh, the guy was so much smarter than I am. That's not the problem. He doesn't need more facts. He needed a different starting point to interpret those facts. There's no evidence for these aliens at all. That would be a whole other talk. He recognized evidence of design. I give him credit for that. But he came to the wrong conclusion as to who that designer was. And there's a lot of evidence. It's the God of the Bible. I gave some of that evidence this morning when we talked about scientific evidence for the inspiration of the Bible. So you can't just throw facts at someone because they're going to interpret it differently. It's all about the starting point. And we got the whole thing backwards. Most people think what you do is you look at evidence. You come to some conclusion and figure out which worldview is correct. It's just the opposite. You start with your worldview, your starting point, and you use that to interpret the evidence, and you come to a conclusion. You have to start with your starting point, or it wouldn't be your starting point. <laughs> so you have to start with what you already believe. You use that to look at evidence and come to a conclusion. So it's very, very interesting. Here's the second reason why you don't use evidence as proof. You're letting the skeptic be the judge. Now, where do we most often hear evidence being presented? Typically in a courtroom situation. Lawyers come in, they present evidence to the judge, and then he or she, along maybe with the jury, gets to decide the truth of the matter. When you present evidence to a skeptic, you are presenting evidence to someone who doesn't think clearly. Now that sounds kind of sarcastic and derogatory. I understand it. I don't mean it that way at all. So why would I even say that? Because I like to be extremely respectful to skeptics, and especially atheists, 
They're smart people. Most of them are really nice. And the mean ones are just like they're a mean Christian too. I mean, they come in all, all different flavors. But they usually have like really good questions because they're thinking through these things. So why would I say they're not thinking clearly? I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I say that because of what Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 1, talking about the skeptics. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. This is not name-calling by God. He's not saying, oh, they're just a bunch of fools. He's describing their thinking process. He's saying because they have chosen in their heart to reject all the evidence God has already given them in the universe and in the DNA and everything else, because they've done that, God says there are consequences for doing such things. Meaning you're not going to be able to think clearly anymore. And that's what happens. The rest of Romans 1 goes into a lot of those details. It's fascinating. So when we, as Christians, come along and say, how could you not see this? God's telling us, this is why they don't see it, because they've rejected all the other evidence. This is a spiritual issue, and we, as Christians, need to understand that. It, I was just thinking this before I came up. If I told you that Amy and I spent the whole afternoon looking for the ocean, and we just couldn't see it, you'd be like, oh, come on. Seriously? It's everywhere you look. And we would say, no, I didn't see it. What do you mean it's everywhere? And she's like, how could you not see it? That's what we do sometimes as skeptics. How can you not see that the DNA had to be designed? It's a spiritual issue. They're spiritually blinded. They're not really thinking correctly. They're plenty smart. They don't need more facts from us. They need to rethink the starting point that they've chosen that they're using to interpret these facts. Third reason why you can't use evidence as proof, the atheist already knows that God exists. There are no atheists on the planet. There never have been. There never will be. Why? And the world, would I say that? That just sounds wrong. Some of you know atheists. There may be atheists here this evening, and I certainly hope so, <laughs> seriously. So why, I would be just honored if they're here. So why would I say something like that? This just sounds wrong. Is it because I've read all the philosophy books and realized all the authors are wrong? No. Have I interviewed all the atheists and realized they're wrong? No. So why would I say it? because of what it says in Romans chapter 1 again. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, talking about the skeptics and atheists. Why? Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, specifically his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. God is the one who has revealed himself to every single person on this planet. Now, some of those people have chosen, like I said before, to reject all that evidence. And they call themselves atheists. So in that sense, there have always been atheists, and there always will be atheists. But they're not people who don't know God exists. They're people who have chosen to reject that knowledge. And God says, you can do that. I'm not going to twist your arm. But if you do that... There are consequences. And again, Romans goes through a lot of those details that we don't have time. That would be a whole other sermon. But these are just three reasons why we don't use evidence as technical 100% proof. Very powerful. So we don't use evidence to prove God's existence or the inspiration of the Word. Those two beliefs, God's existence and the inspiration of the Bible, that's our starting point. We have chosen that as our starting point. Everyone picks something, that's what we have chosen. Again, you're somewhat tracking, but you're still confused. Like, again, I'm not sure like, how that's, if I tell that to an atheist, how that's going to impress them. Hang in there. <laughs> again, it's going to make perfect sense. So how do you approach the skeptic then if you're witnessing to him? I highly, highly recommend you start with God's Word. That's where we start. We should start with them. Oh, but they're going to say, oh, I don't believe the Bible's the inspired Word of God. And I always say, oh, I totally get that. You don't even think that God exists. You certainly don't think the Bible is God's word. I'm going to share it with you anyway. And here's why. Do not assume the skeptic accurately understands what the Bible claims for itself. So I used to travel around giving all these evidences for God's existence and the inspiration of the Bible. And along the way, I convinced the number of skeptics that, wow, it looks like it really is written by God. But guess what? It was depressing to them. Why? Because they had the idea that God was a mean ogre who hated them, was just waiting for them to mess up and smash them and send them to hell. And then 
I came along and said, yep, that's right. <laughs> that's what it says. Like, no, <laughs> not at all. Don't assume they understand what the Bible is really claiming. Make sure they understand the 100% holiness of God and how much he loves them. And even though they've chosen to reject him, he still loves them. And he actually sent his son to die on a cross to pay for their sins. That's how much he loves them. And, you know, explain to them what the Bible says. Even if they're saying they don't believe it, that's fine. I want you to at least have an accurate understanding of the claims it's making rather than what maybe someone else told you about it. So make sure you explain what it's actually saying, and then you can go about explaining why you have chosen to believe its claims and how it best explains the real world that we're living in. And that's what we're going to do the rest of this talk is we're going to show how the Bible makes sense of this upside-down world that we're in right now. So what good is evidence? A lot of people get frustrated. It's like, man, I just learned some cool things, and now you're telling me evidence is useless. I never said that. I never said evidence is useless. I just said we can't technically use it as 100% proof. But evidence can be really, really powerful. And I gave a lot of evidence this morning for the inspiration of the Bible. Powerful stuff. We should understand it, and we can use it. We're not trying to technically prove something 100% because no one can do that with evidence. But what you show is that what you're saying, there's a lot of reasons. What we do, reasons for believing it's true. We're not trying to prove anything. We're going to take out these worldviews, an atheistic worldview and a Christian worldview, take them out for a test drive and see how well they work. How well do they explain the evidence we're looking at? So that's what we're going to do with the rest of this talk. We're going to look at a few specific things and ask each side, hey, how does your worldview account for this thing that we're talking about right now? And just see how well they work. We're going to look at three philosophical tests and three scientific tests. Each time, we're going to look at a specific thing and ask each worldview to explain the existence of this thing that we're talking about. It'll make a lot of sense, and it's really, really powerful. We're going to start out looking at three philosophical things, three philosophical tests of these two worldviews, Christian worldview, atheistic worldview. The first thing we're going to discuss is logic. <laughs> So what are we doing? Okay, we're going to think about what logic is, and then we're going to ask each side, how do you account for the existence of this thing that we all call logic? So I would ask an atheist a number of questions. I would ask him, do you believe that logic exists? And they always say, well, of course I do. What are you, crazy? Why would you even ask that? Okay, I'm, I'm just checking. Do you believe there are laws of logic? like the law of non-contradiction. I can't both be standing here talking to you right now and not standing here talking to you right now. Law of non-contradiction. Do you believe there are laws of logic? And they always say, yeah, I believe there are laws of logic. Okay. Are these laws physical things? Can I take them into a laboratory and weigh them and paint them and bend them? They would say, no, they're, they're not physical things. They're, they're non-physical things. Okay. Are these laws of logic the same everywhere? Are they the same here in Florida as they are in Wisconsin or in California? Well, maybe not California. Um, <laughs> sorry if you're from there. But are, are they the same everywhere? Or are they different in different places? And the atheists would say, well, no, they're not different. They're the same everywhere. Okay. Uh, do they change? Will they be the same tomorrow morning as they are right now? Were they the same 2,000 years ago? Or do they change over time? And the atheists would say, well, no, they, they don't change. They stay the same. All right, let me summarize this to make sure I got your, your worldview accurate here. You believe there are laws of logic which are immaterial. They're non-physical things. They're the same everywhere, and they do not change. And they say, yes, that's what I believe. Okay, then I, just, I have one more question about this. <laughs> Where did they come from? Using your worldview, the thing that you chose as your starting point, there is no God Everything is matter and energy. There's no soul, no spirit, no God. Everything is matter and energy. Um, but you believe in these laws of logic that are non-physical things. We've never seen a physical thing create a non-physical thing, but you believe in these non-physical things. So what is it in your worldview that accounts for these, the existence of these non-physical things that you believe in? And then secondly, using your starting point that you chose, help me understand how do you know they're the, they're the same everywhere? What is it in your starting point that tells you, oh, they have to be the same everywhere? And then lastly, what is it in your worldview that you chose <laughs> explains how you know for sure they never change. They always stay the same. There is absolutely nothing in an atheistic worldview that can account 
for the existence of non-physical laws of logic that are the same everywhere and they do not change. No, they believe in those things, they use them, and they demand you to be logical. But their own worldview can't even account for it. And if you think about it, if you cannot account for the existence of logic, you're done. Because you need to use that to talk about anything else. Even to have a discussion about logic, you need to be using logic, right? So that's just one test, not going so well for the atheist. Now it's only fair we turn the table and ask the Christian, how do we account for these non-physical laws of logic? This is awesome. This makes me smile when I think through this. Christians believe in a God who himself is a non-physical being. He's the same everywhere, and he does not change. That God created a universe that operates under the laws of logic, which themselves are non-physical. They're the same everywhere, and they do not change. They reflect his character. It makes perfect sense within a Christian worldview, but it's totally antithetical or against an atheistic worldview. Here's another quick analogy. Imagine an old gunfight out west, and you have these two cowboys. One first walks up to the other one and says, Hey, can I, can I borrow your gun? I need to kill you right now. <laughs> it's like, get your own gun. <laughs> An atheist needs to borrow from the Christian worldview to use logic to tell us why the Christian worldview isn't valid. It, it doesn't make really any sense. Here's one more quote. I mentioned Sam Harris, one of the leading atheists today. If I had shown you this quote right at the beginning before I got into the talk at all, you might have been kind of intimidated by it. Now you're going to smirk when you hear what he said. He said, if someone doesn't value logic, what logical argument would you invoke to prove they should value logic? He was kind of condescending when he said that. It's like, wait a minute, your own worldview can't even account for the existence of logic. Fits in perfectly with the Christian worldview, but you shouldn't be saying that we're illogical because where did logic even come from? It's kind of interesting, but that was just the first philosophical test. Here's the second one. Absolute morality. We're going to think about absolute morality and ask each side to account for it. Why is it, no matter where you go on the planet, people just seem to know you can't just shoot someone because you don't like their hat? I mean, we know that murder is wrong intrinsically. Now, some people commit it anyway, but the vast, vast majority of people who commit murder, they knew it was wrong. They wanted to do it anyway, for whatever reason. A very, very, very small percentage of the population, there's something mentally wrong with them, and they, they can't really make heads or tails of anything. That's, a very small, that's an exception. We know why that's happening, because they, they don't have the ability to think straight. Everyone else, they know murder is wrong. How does an atheistic worldview account for that? Well, that's how we've evolved. We, we've evolved to sense that murder is wrong. Oh, evolution, yes. Okay, help me out. That, that's that whole natural selection, survival of the fittest thing. Yeah. Okay, so if I as a Christian think the atheists are giving me a hard time and I just wipe them all out, you can't tell me I'm wrong. That's just survival of the fittest, if I'm more fit than they are. Well, no, you can't just kill all the atheists. Hey, that's how you believe we got here. If it wasn't for survival of the fittest, human beings would not be on the planet. It was natural selection, survival of the fittest over millions and millions of years that brought us here. And now you're telling me it's wrong? I missed the memo. When did that change? <laughs> they cannot explain why it's wrong. Well, it's, it's the way chemicals move in your brain to give you that sensation that it's wrong. Oh, chemicals, yes. So if my chemicals move a different way and I kill you, no one can tell me it was wrong. It's just chemicals. I'm not controlling that. Well, no, you can't do that because <laughs> an atheist has no basis for claiming that murder is wrong. Well, it's wrong. We have laws against it. You are right. We have laws. But guess what? We weren't sitting around one day saying, we, don't, we have no idea what to think about murder. Oh, someone made a law? Oh, I guess we decided it's bad. <laughs> no, we all knew it was wrong. So we said, you know what? We need to write some laws. So when people murder someone else, we've already decided what we're going to do about it because we know it's wrong. So it's just the reverse. We made the law because we all recognized it was wrong. Turn the tables. Ask the Christian, how do you account for this? Very simple. Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. It violates the character of God. God has put the moral law into everyone's heart. That's why we know it's wrong. It makes perfect sense in a Christian worldview, but there's no justification for why murder is wrong. Again, they might not like it, it might not help society, but they can't actually say it's wrong. <laughs> They've just chosen to say it because, yeah, God has put in their heart that it's wrong. That's how they know. But they have no basis from their worldview for claiming it's actually wrong. 
Third and final philosophical test, knowledge and certainty. This one's kind of fun. <laughs> you can ask an atheist, is there anything you know absolutely for sure? There's no way you could be wrong. And they might say, uh, I know I'm here right now. How do you know you're here right now? Because I'm talking to you. How do you know you're not just dreaming that you're talking to me? Because you're talking back to me. How do you know you're not just dreaming that I'm talking back to you? <laughs> I can pinch myself. I can feel it. How do you know you didn't just dream that you pinched yourself and felt it? This is interesting. I'm not going to flesh this out. But technically, none of us can prove we're here right now. Now, there's so much overwhelming evidence that we're here. Nobody questions it. We, we, we know we're here, even though technically we couldn't prove it. Um, and here's another question. If I told you that my next door neighbor's oldest son was 31, but I, I, I could be wrong, do I know absolutely for sure he's 31 if I just admitted eh, I could be wrong? No, I'm, I don't know for sure if I'm admitting I could be wrong. With that in mind, you can ask the atheist, out of all the knowledge that's possible to know, what percentage do you think you know? They would probably say pretty small percentage and say, yeah, me too. But for argument's sake, let's say they think they know 1% of everything. Okay? I would ask them, is it possible? Is it even possible that something in the 99% you're admitting you don't know might reveal what you thought you knew in the 1% was wrong? Is that possible that could happen? And they'll all admit, yeah, I guess it's possible I could find out what I thought I knew was wrong. So if it's possible you're wrong about the 1%, do you even know the 1%? Actually, you can't know anything for sure. Well, you can't either. Are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> now, it sounds very juvenile at this point. I'm not trying to go there. I'm just working through their world view. Now, there is one way you could know something for sure. And that is if you knew 100% of everything. There's no chance of learning anything new because you, you already know it all. You're not going to be wrong about it because you know everything. Now, that doesn't work well for us. I used to know everything, but now I know better. <laughs> but there's another way you could know something for sure. And that is if you knew somebody who knew everything and that person chose to tell you some of that and they didn't lie about it. That's the Christian worldview. God knows everything, and he's revealed some of that to us in a way we could understand, and he does not lie about it. A Christian has a philosophical basis for claiming to know something absolutely for sure because God can give us that knowledge. We don't just have to try to reason through it and figure, oh, I'm pretty confident. No, God can actually put absolute knowledge in you. Philosophically, that could happen. A Christian has a philosophical basis for claiming that they could know something for sure, whereas an atheist has to admit they could be wrong about everything. Again, we're just testing these worldviews, and it is not going well at all for an atheist. We're not even telling them you're a bad person, you're wrong. We're just saying, hey, this isn't going well so far. And we have three more tests left. And we could do a lot more. We're just scratching the surface here. We're going to look at three quick scientific tests, taking these two worldviews out for a test drive. We're going to look at the origin of the universe. In each one of these scientific tests we're going to look at, they have beliefs and predictions about particular things, like the origin of the universe, and then we're going to look at evidence to see if their beliefs and predictions make sense. With the origin of the universe, an atheistic worldview says that this universe came about through a Big Bang, which they say is a natural event. Now, a lot of religious people and a lot of even Christians say, well, yeah, I believe in the Big Bang. I mean, the Big Bang couldn't happen on its own. Someone had to cause it. We believe that God's, God caused it, caused it. He's all-powerful. He can do anything he wants. I agree that God is all-powerful. I agree he could do anything he wants. It's not about what he could do. He's all-powerful. There's nothing physical that he couldn't do because he's all-powerful. That's not the question. The question is, what did he say he did? And that's a whole other talk. The Big Bang does not fit in with Scripture, and it's not even a good scientific model for the origin of the universe. It's a whole other talk. I'll just give you a snippet. There's one, probably the most interesting thing about the Big Bang, and that is it doesn't explain the origin of the universe. <laughs> Wait a minute, that, that's what it is. It's, you know, this explosion or whatever. No, the Big Bang doesn't even kick in until after you have the stuff you need. 
You need matter and energy. The Big Bang is not a power. It's just a description of what they think happened to the stuff that came out of nowhere for no reason and how it expanded and formed the universe. So it's not a force. The Big Bang is not a force. It's a description of what they think happened to stuff that they can't explain where it came from. So the Big Bang doesn't create anything. It's just a description, but it doesn't even start until after you have the stuff you need. So it doesn't explain the origin of the universe, and it's not even a good description. There are a lot of problems with physics and all that that I have to skip for now. But the Big Bang was drafted as an explanation to try to account for the origin of the universe apart from God. So when Christians or other religious people say, well, yeah, God used the Big Bang, they're telling us, you don't understand this. We don't need your God. We have this taken care of apart from the supernatural. They don't, but that's the point of it. In fact, Sir Frederick Hoyle, he's one of the world's leading mathematicians and astronomers. He was an atheist for most of his life. He came to the conclusion there must be a God just by studying math and science. When he heard about this new idea for the origin of the universe, he said, what, like a big bang? He was being sarcastic, and the name stuck. <laughs> so that's where the name came from. But the atheists believe the big bang accounts in a 100% naturalistic way for the origin of the universe. No supernatural, it's just something that happened. What would Christians say? Christians say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those are the two beliefs and predictions. Let's take a look at some evidence to see which side the evidence would fit better with. I'm going to look at two major things. First is the first and second laws of thermodynamics. These are probably the two best laws we have in science. The first law, in a nutshell, says you can't get something out of nothing. It's so consistent, we made a law out of it. We've never, ever, ever, ever seen an exception. Quick side note, I don't want to extend my talk too much. But you can't get something out of nothing. And they know that. So how do they answer that? Very quickly, Lawrence Krauss, he's one of the leading astrophysicists today, or sorry, sorry, theoretical physicists. Brilliant guy, but he's an atheist. So he had to count. How do you get something out of nothing? This is what one of the leading brilliant scientists said. He goes, when you, think, when you think about nothing, you typically think of the absence of anything. I'm with him on that. <laughs> he said, but that's a philosophical definition of nothing. I don't care what philosophers think, he said. I care about the nothing of reality. And if the nothing of reality is filled with stuff, I'll go with that. What? So we know today men can be women, women can be men, and now nothing can be something. He can't get a universe out of nothing, so he just refines, redefines nothing to be something, and then that something could create the universe. That makes no sense. It's not scientific, and then you would just ask, where did the stuff come from that's in the nothing? <laughs> it, it makes no sense, but they're desperate because they can't account for the universe apart from the supernatural, but they're trying. So, first law says you can't get something out of nothing. The second law says when you do have stuff left to its own, it goes downhill becomes less and less useful over time. The Big Bang says you start with stuff and it expands and it gets more and more ordered and more and more complex over time. That's the opposite of the second law of thermodynamics. Those two best laws that we have go totally against their view. The second thing up here, something called fine-tuning or the anthropic principle. There are so many factors in the universe that are very finely tuned. If their values aren't right, 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 right where they are, Life isn't possible. So the question becomes, was there really this big bang and all these factors in physics and other areas just turned out to be right where they need to be? We got so lucky? Or would there be evidence of design? Yeah, it's that way because God designed it so life would be possible. So I have a talk where I go into a lot more details on this. We're just going to look at two factors. We could look at tons of them. I'm just going to bring up two as an example. We have... Uh, the force of gravity, the gravitational constant, and the cosmological constant. That has to do with the energy density of empty space. You can forget about that. These are just two factors in physics that are so finely tuned, it seems like it's impossible. They've actually calculated. What are the chances? There's no God, no designer, no creator. There was just this big bang, and just these two turn out to be right where they need to be. The chances they've calculated are one chance in 100 million Trillion, 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 trillion. <laughs> if you haven't studied math or science much yet, that's a big number. That screams there's absolutely no way. And that's just two of those factors. Here's a quote from Owen Gingrich. Or, or, this is first uh, Frederick Hoyle. This is a guy who said, what, a big bang? This was a guy who was an atheist most of his life. He said this, 
A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that its super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces we're talking about in nature. He just says, you look at the world around us, there's no way it's an accident. And that came from a guy who was an atheist. He realized there's got to be a God. It, it's powerful. i got to keep moving here. So the evidence fits very well in the Christian worldview that it took a supernatural almighty God to bring things into existence and order them versus it all came from nothing for no reason and it got better and better and better over time. That makes no sense. We don't see that in science whatsoever. Second of the three scientific tests, the variety of life. Millions of species on this planet, the great variety. I mentioned it briefly this morning. We're going to overlap a little bit this, this evening, and I have to be supernaturally brief with this because I could go on for years and years and years with this. Atheistic view tells us that everything came about through evolution, which is mutations and natural selection. Mutations are generally copying errors in the DNA. When creatures reproduce, they take the DNA they have that made them, they make a copy of it and give it to their offspring. And their offspring are just like they are. If they were fish, their offspring are fish. Dogs, dogs, and all that. It's a copy of the same DNA, but there's so much information in the DNA that sometimes copying errors happen. Oops, oops, oops. And that's supposed to drive evolution. That's supposed to take a single-celled organism and turn it into us. By taking the DNA that a single cell has, which is very complex, copying it and making mistakes. Oops, 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 wasn't supposed to do that. Oops, 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 and eventually here we are, and we're so much better now from all these errors in the information. I have a whole talk on that. I've got to skip that one for now, but that's what atheists believe and evolutionists believe. Christian worldview says this, that everything would reproduce after its kind. I mentioned that this morning. Ten times in Genesis 1, God created creatures to reproduce after their kind. Yeah, they can create a variety, but always within limits. And so today, again, as I mentioned this morning, you can breed a dog and a wolf, and you get a wolf dog. It's, again, good genetics, good science. That's what the Bible would predict. But you can't breed a dog and a hummingbird and get something like that. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's funny because we know it's impossible, and geneticists will say, yeah, that's never going to happen. The genetics don't line up. There are limits to reproduction. You're not going to get this progression from a single cell all the way up to a human being. Everything has these genetic limits. So there's so much more I can say, but i, I got to keep moving here. It fits in perfectly well with the Christian worldview, but it's against an atheistic worldview. Third and final scientific test, the origin of information. We use information all the time, but you don't really think about what it is. You just use it. We're going to think about what it is and ask each side to account for where, where did information come from? Again, an atheistic worldview says random actions of particles and molecules over time created all the complex information in every living thing today. And it's unbelievably complex. I wish I had time to tell you about that. But they believe it's just particles banging together over time creates all this complex information. The Christian worldview says in the beginning uh, was the word in John 1. The word in Greek there is logos. God spoke things into beginning, into, into existence. He spoke this information into the living things. It's incredibly complex. Those are the two views. Let's take a look at evidence. Now, when you look at a newspaper, it's made out of paper and ink. A newspaper can hold a lot of information, again, using paper and ink. You look at books. Books can hold even more information using paper and ink. And then we have a thumb drive, metal and a little bit of plastic. Um, that can hold even more information than books. And then you have hard drives made out of, you know, uh, silicon metals and things like that. It can hold even more information than just a thumb drive. In each of those cases, those materials, they do a great job of storing information. But in none of those cases do those materials create the information. The ink and the paper did not write the newspaper article. A columnist did. The ink and the paper didn't write the book. The author did that. They're just using paper and ink to store the information that they put there. Same thing with the thumb drive and the hard drive. Those materials didn't create Microsoft Office software. Software engineers did, and they just used those materials to store the information. In each one of those cases, you can always trace the information back to an intelligent source every single time. Now we look at DNA. DNA is also physical materials. 
and it has even more information on it, and its storage capacity is unbelievable. So let's talk about the storage capacity of DNA. We'll first ask, how much space does DNA take up? You know, how much volume size? Well, a typical human adult has about 100 trillion cells in their body. And each one of those cells in the nucleus has a strand of DNA. If you went into just one cell and took out the DNA, it'd be about six feet long. But it's super, super thin. In fact, if you took the DNA out of each cell in your body and lined them up end to end, you'd be dead. So don't do that. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's just talk about one strand. A cell from the tip of your finger, microscopic cell, you take the DNA out of that one cell, six feet long, how much space does that take up? The volume of it. It's 0 0.000000, 17 zeros, and then a three cubic meters. It is tiny, 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 tiny. But all the information to develop your body and help you function is all in that single strand, and it's copied on every strand in those cells. But the, the fact that the DNA in the tip of your finger it could make an eyeball there. It could make a brain, a nervous system. But it says, no, I'm on the tip of a finger. I'm just going to make the skin cell here. It knows where it is, and it knows what to do, even though it has all the information to do everything. It's very, very complex. In fact, the, the first book I wrote on creation there has about 300 pages in it. You could fit over 5,200 copies of that book in just one strand of your DNA. Super thin, six feet long, but so thin, it's that small, but you could fit 300 copies or over 5,000 copies of that book on one strand. Furthermore, let's say you had a pinhead amount of your DNA, so a very small amount, just the head of a pin, you have that volume of your DNA. How much information could we store in a pinhead? Well, we used to use CDs. CDs can hold about 100,000 pages of text in a single CD. Then we have thumb drives. A 128-gig thumb drive could hold about 197 CDs times 100,000 pages. That's a lot of information on a thumb drive. Now we have portable hard drives. A 2-terabyte hard drive, which is roughly the size of my Bible. Some of them are smaller. You could hold 16 thumb drives on there. So that's pretty impressive what we're able to do with data storage. Right, let's compare that to just a pinhead amount of your DNA. You could store two million two terabyte hard drives in a pinhead amount of your DNA. But we're told particles smashing together in nature created an information storage system like that. Again, my faith isn't strong enough to believe a story like that. It makes no sense. We don't see that happening in nature. Um, this is something that shows evidence of design. So it fits in perfectly well with the Christian worldview that an intelligent designer created that storage system. It's consistent with everything we experience ourselves. Every time you see information, you can trace it back to an intelligent source. So again, it fits in with the Christian worldview. So all we did here is we took these two worldviews out for a test drive. And we only looked at six things. We could go on and on and on and on. And it didn't work well at all for an atheistic worldview. And at this point, if I'm talking to an atheist, I said, you are more than welcome to continue to stick with that worldview, but you're going to have no end of trouble using that to make sense of the world around you. In fact, the only one that really works consistently is the Christian worldview. So in one sense, it's not about proving that God exists and the Bible is his word. It's that if you don't start with that, you can't prove anything else. Seriously, if there is no God... You can't justify the existence of logic. There wouldn't be logic. Why would there be logic, and why should you be logical at all? There's no need to be. Like, who says you have to be if there's no God? Only the Christian worldview makes sense of this. Now, you can have some generic God and account for maybe the existence of the universe, some generic God, you know, created a universe, that's fine. But how would you know which God that is? The only way you would know which God that is, you can't get that from looking at the DNA. You can look at DNA and say, okay, this isn't an accident. It must have been created by something outside of nature which would be supernatural, super meaning above or beyond. You could detect supernatural evidence from looking at DNA, but you wouldn't know who created it, why they created it, why you're here, or what happens to you when you die. You can't get that from looking at dirt or DNA. The only way you would know is if that creator left you a note. And that's what the Bible claims to be. It claims to be a note from the God who created everything saying, hello, I'm the one who created it all. Here's why I created it. Here's what happened to it. Here's my plan to fix it. 
Here's why you're here, and here's what happens to you when you die. We could only know those details from a note from the Creator. And this morning I gave a lot of evidence as to why we can trust that this is that note from the Creator. We don't have a note from aliens. We don't have a note from some other God. We have a note from the God of the Bible who gives evidence for his existence, and it's very rational, rational and reasonable to believe those claims. So, two major elements of the Christian worldview. God exists, and the Bible's his word. You don't start there, you have all sorts of problems. What we just walked through technically is called presuppositional apologetics. And I didn't tell you that up front. You would have all run out of here to go watch paint dry, which sounds more interesting. <laughs> but what is this? Presuppositions. Those are things you presuppose to be true. You assume they're true to begin with. And then you use those assumptions to do apologetics, defending the Christian worldview. So we presuppose God exists in the Bible as his word, and we use that foundation to defend everything else, to defend the Christian worldview. And it works very, very well. But if you don't start with that, you really can't prove anything at all. So a very different approach, but I think it's the proper approach rather than saying, well, I believe the Bible is true because look at this evidence. Well, guess what you're doing? You're placing evidence in authority over God's word. Someone else might interpret it differently. Maybe you find some evidence that doesn't look so good. Well, maybe the Bible isn't the inspired word of God. Oh, now it is. Now it isn't. Now it is. Now it isn't. The whole time you're letting evidence or science or someone else's opinion sit in authority over God's word versus doing it the opposite way. This is the word of God. It's true. And we use this to make sense of the evidence. And when you do that, you can be consistent all the way through. Very, very powerful, but a very different approach. So that's the whole myth of facts versus faith. So the next time someone says they're all out of facts and science, um, you can think about it a little bit differently. One other quote, uh, sometimes a scientist will say, science is the only way of determining truth. That's very intimidating. Meaning, forget that Bible stuff. That's an old religious thing. You can't use that. Yeah, I'm supposed to ignore what all the scientists have discovered and just trust you in your old religious book. So it sounds intimidating when someone says science is the only way of determining truth. This is part of another talk, and I'll end with this. <laughs> um, all you have to do is ask that person a question about what they just said. They said science is the only way of determining truth. I would just ask them, how did you figure out that's true? How did you determine that science is the only way of determining truth. Did you use science to do that? If you did, that's circular reasoning. You can't use science to prove science. <laughs> but if you didn't use science, apparently there are other ways of determining truth because you yourself just used one. <laughs> so here's an estate, a statement that initially is kind of intimidating, but when you think through it, it's self-defeating. It makes no sense at all. But it requires critical thinking skills to learn how to respond when someone says something like that. And there are a lot of other examples, part of a different talk here.